So let's give it up for our Ignite speakers before we get started. All right. Ignite speakers, you ready? Audience, you ready? Yeah. All right. Where's Andrew at? Andrew's not ready. There's Andrew. Andrew's ready. All right. So, Andrew here is talking about DevOps sharing the culture, the why and how. I've heard a couple of nights from him before. He's a great guy. Andrew, when you're ready. I am ready. Let's go. Go. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Martin. I am a senior DevOps engineer in the AI Labs group currently. Prior to that, I worked as a cloud engineer for a financial services software shop up north, and before that, as a DevOps platform engineer to large telecoms. So now that you know a little bit about me, let's get on to the somewhat controversial, in some circles, context of this talk. DevOps is not a job role. It's a culture. I say that as someone with the title DevOps engineer, but really my day job is more of an automation engineer or an infrastructure systems engineer or cloud engineer. But I think DevOps is actually a culture and it's very important for everyone who works in the organization, no matter where you are, to be an ambassador for DevOps culture. So what do I mean by DevOps culture? I think these six tenets summarize what forms DevOps culture, and they all build on each other. Things like embracing change as an organization, enabling open communication between teams, tearing down those silos and those walls, adopting tools that enable transparency and automation, meaningful automation, enabling innovation, and that can be personal or technical innovation, being able to learn and experiment with things, having accountability, but not a blame culture, being able to embrace failure, realizing that failure is how you progress and fail fast, if that's the case. Reward successes, and all of that leads to trust. Trust between coworkers, trust between organizations, trust between different working groups. So taking a step back, let's talk about how software development works here. Randall Monroe's comic XKCD I think lays it out pretty well. Though we're changing the processes around software development with DevOps and DevOps culture, the underlying things that go into software development might not be changing that much. Give you a moment to read that long wall of text there. <laughs> so why do we actually want to do DevOps? What material practices go into that? These are some of them. You want more development in your operations, more operations in your development. Things like infrastructure as code, containerization, these are just some things that go into DevOps materially. And there's the agile software development lifecycle, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with here. Maybe some of you are also familiar with waterfall or the confluence of the two, scrumfall. Agile software development lifecycle, that really goes hand in hand with DevOps, um, but I think it's important to take a step back and really ask the question, you know, why are we putting all this effort into doing these process changes and changing the way we're working? Well, as a Randall Monroe's other XKCD comic here says, sometimes you put in a lot of effort and it's important to question why. The reason we do Agile, the reason we do DevOps is to decrease time to market, increase quality, and enable more engaged, happier teams. So, sounds great, right? Sounds easy. And I'm sure that's how it's often sold. But, actually, it's pretty hard to implement DevOps culture or DevOps practices and be successful. So, tread carefully, avoid the pitfalls, Make sure you're thinking about the changes that you're implementing and the changes in processes, the tools you're using, because if you don't, you can increase the pain points instead of decreasing them. So here are some tips on how to do that. Formalize the end state that success looks like. Share that, stand by it. You're gonna have to change as you go your course, that's fine, but the end state that you're looking for should be thought out and you shouldn't have to change that. Be realistic when you assess the current state of your organization. Plan to incrementally improve that. Culture changes don't happen overnight. Set milestones, reassess the progress, and this is the most important one of all, and this is what I think makes DevOps a culture of sharing, enabling open communication. You want development to talk to operations. You want your IT people to talk to your business people. 
They should maybe speak the same language or at least understand the same language. Remember, DevOps is really about people over process. If you follow those four tips, you'll have a better chance of implementing DevOps successfully. So bring it full circle here. Communication, that second step there, I think is where a lot of organizations have trouble. That's where a lot of, a lot of folks stumble. Being able to talk to people who don't do the same thing you do every day can be hard, but that's the most important. My conclusion, merging the knowledge of development operations. Organizations of almost any size can make software development lifecycle smoother for all involved and improve the final product for customers. Thanks, everyone. Come on up. Come on up, Larry. He's hot, sir. We're ready? Sorry, I need more notes than he does. <laughs> All right, so Barry's up here talking about a case for Sprint Zero. Barry, whenever you're ready, say go. There's no such thing as Sprint Zero, right? So I'm ready, let's go. So this approach uh, focuses on the enterprise. This is for those large companies that we struggle to change. We still have lots of silos, right? Legal procurement, compliance, audit, all of those things are upfront things that we have to deal through. Still approvals, and sometimes those things feel like black holes, right? So it applies to anything that we're introducing new to your tech stack. It's like getting a new puppy. Disruption is imminent, it's going to happen. To what degree and by whom and at what point, we don't know, right? So our teams are supposed to be focused on delivering uh, value quickly. And, but in, in, our, in our enterprises, how many teams are really delivering, uh, focus on delivering to production all the way? So we should be rating ourselves from the time of code check into pride and how we should be measuring. Uh, unfortunately for many teams that I've seen, if it's demoed, it's done. So there's never a, a, the closing of the gap between the demo and getting it all the way into production. And where do most demos take place? Never in Pride, right? Scrum and Agile are focused on learning and then applying those learnings. That's what this is. So our objective, I'm, I'm ahead, sorry. So our objective is to start learning now immediately. And how would we do that? We would move forward in every manner possible. Get your siloed partners involved now and find out what impediments that they're going to put in front of you so that you can address them and start moving now. Throughput and stability should be the important things to us. Experience, maturity, durability of your tech stack are the key factors to make sure that those things remain. This means that anything new that we deliver will have some negative impact in your, in your delivery pipeline. So to offset that negative impact, let's pull those unknowns as far forward as possible. Proclaim yourself as a product owner for the release pipeline for this new capability. Create a sprint goal to deliver the new pipeline all the way to pride. The sprint should occur prior to any upcoming sprint. You could call it current sprint minus one if you want, or in my case, I could just call it sprint zero. The one PBI in the sprint will have lots of tasks, conversations, debates, arguments, all kinds of good discussion. Uh, and your first sprint zero may not make it all the way to pride. So you may need a sprint zero prime, prime two, those types of things to actually get your results. So the content of the sprint's not important. Hello world level stuff, right? All it needs to do is prove that the pipeline is capable and ready and the pipeline is your deliverable. So this applies to any new, um, any new technology that you're bringing in. Could be a language, could be a framework, could be new IaaS, could be new PaaS, could be a cloud provider, even just new VMs, build tools, test tools, anything that's part of your automation change that. Um, so containers are actually a, the perfect example. So containers by themselves are easy, right? But the whole supporting ecosystem to manage, instrument, build, secure, monitor, store, and have all of those nuances in place, that's gonna take time. And that time is gonna be your enemy. It's gonna include new contracts, new vendors, security approvals, budget approvals, all of that takes time. So plan for it, don't delay, start now. So SaaS integrations are the new big challenge from my perspective. 
They are the new monoliths. There are no microservices in SaaS, right? So they are going to be highly disruptive. There are lots of reasons for it. Your business expects them to work, right? They just turn them on. We're going to do a little bit of configuration, and we're off to the races. We don't even need you. So for your hello world, for the SaaS integrations, be sure to include things like test environment alignment, test data management, environment refreshes. All of those come into play. And then there's some unique challenges you'll learn, and you're going to learn a lot from this experience. So winding this up, the approach supports gaining as much experience as possible by deploying something real into production early, often. And the intent is to build your competences and to build your confidence. This approach is definitely not part of the Scrum Guide. I would argue that it does embody the Agile core principles, though. Um, if your pipeline can be built and improved before your MVP is ready to ship, name it whatever you want. It's the outcome that I'll take. Initial deployments become non-events, and all you have to do is deliver a Hello World example to prod early, and often, and multiple times. And then you swap out the MVP for the Hello World, deliver it again, new payload, same pipeline. If you're deploying to prod it for the first time with your MVP, trouble is going to happen. This approach will dramatically reduce those risks. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Carl, come on up. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, machine learning and how that fits into DevOps. So you might start to be dabbling in machine learning in your company or uh, going deep in it. Um, I'll talk about an open source framework called uh, Kubeflow that runs in Kube, uh, Kubernetes today. So first, let's talk about some problems that you might see uh, in machine learning where there's a lot of optimization tuning to get this perfect model and you make one change and it can make everything fall apart. So you really need to track those experiments. Another issue is data validation. In the software engineering world, we have unit tests. We have lots of ways to make sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, in an AI world, we need to think about the data, the inputs, the outputs. How do we track those? How do we make sure we're improving? Um, life cycle management is another issue that's sort of new to the machine learning world. Uh, you have uh, data prep, transform, validation. Building the model is just a small part of the process for it all to work right. Uh, another issue is that, uh, you know, often our data scientists might be working with different, say, package dependencies, different systems. They're not necessarily using the standard infrastructure that you have, like, say, Kubernetes in your organization. Those are some of the common problems that come up. So Kubeflow makes it easy to develop, manage, and deploy your infrastructure on Kubernetes, and it can be portable. So you can do it locally, on the cloud, on-premise, on different clouds in kind of one uh, system. So what does it do? Uh, development, building your models, that kind of thing, training the models, getting analytics on it, serving, you see like a REST endpoint once you've built your model, sending uh, items for prediction, and then orchestrating that into a workflow. Uh, so how would you install it? Um, there is a command line uh, utility, like if you're familiar with uh, uh, Kubernetes, there's kubectl. Here we have uh, kfctl for uh, kubeflow. Uh, there's also a GUI interface to install it um, on GCP. Once you've installed it, this just kind of shows an example of your various uh, services, you know, your cluster that's built for you uh, with all the different parts of a machine learning framework uh, running on Kubernetes. Uh, this is what the dashboard looks like. Uh, from there, you can uh, do your development. You can launch Jupyter Notebooks. That's kind of like the IDE for data scientists. Run jobs, uh, look at the pipelines, everything you need to do here on, this, uh, on that dashboard. Um, this is a Jupyter Notebook. Um, if you haven't seen this before, it's a way for data scientists to iterate and try little pieces of code without compiling a whole program and deploying it to kind of see the results as they go. So it's a very popular tool for that that gets installed um, in uh, Kubeflow. 
Well, let me, just a couple other things I just want to say about it. Um, that it runs on Kubernetes. Uh, it's a great way to kind of lay out your machine learning infrastructure. It's open source, so I happen to be from Google, but we have uh, all clouds are supported. We have contributors from all different companies. Um, if you want to find us, we have a Slack channel. We're on Twitter at Kubeflow is the handle. Uh, also, if you have any questions about DevOps and machine learning and how those kind of fit together, uh, feel free to find me after the presentation. Um, sorry, I can only give you half of the deck. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, Roberto, you're up. It's here for Roberto. All right, Roberto, when you're ready, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Let's do it. Well, uh, just a little background, who am I? It's got a couple of slides here. Who am I? I like to do skydiving, go to beaches, uh, do scuba diving, go whatever I can do in my free time. Don't do it DevOps. I'm 100 DevOps, only 12, 14 hours, but not the whole day. Um, what is, uh, I'm talking about uh, ELK, what is Elasticsearch Kibana, how those is integrated with DevOps dashboard for Adobe. Adobe is a tool that allows you to do continuous integration, delivery, code quality, code review. You can do, you can have Nexus, Kibana, and Kibana, Elasticsearch. Um, they were there from the beginning, but you have a lot of me, uh, source. So you're getting metrics for Sonar, uh, for Gen Jenkins for, for the REST API, and we were not handling those. Uh, we have also Jenkins and other services. Uh, everything's running on Docker, but you don't have any metrics. You have only one single metrics at the first time. That was a big one with all the source included. You don't know how that's, uh, what is coming from, what is the time stand. If someone is coming for, well, I'm getting file three or four or four, you don't know anything about that. Uh, what was the solution? What we thought about this one was we keep doing uh, Docker containers. We're going to do the same thing with Docker, but we are going to use big log stats, the last session, and keep on the whole stat to get those solutions done and trying to figure out how to go for the big the huge log that we have on how to segregate, how to split it in different sources, how do you get a Jenkins method for the recipe, how do you get Sonar Q for the recipe, because you need uh, to correlate those using the same name of the project or trying to do some kind of data correlation. So something much better was good at the end of the process. You get bit to collect the different sources, so you can do some transformations before to deliver log stats. You have to do something more complex. You have to do it in log stats, doing transformation with GROP, and then you deliver it to different ends using multiple lines. The multiple lines allow you to don't mess up between process. Uh, this is an example that applied to all the process that we did, but this is an example for Jenkins. Uh, the one that is involved is the Jenkins matrix is reading the Jenkins log from the REST API and then converting that, doing some transformation, deliver it to bit and bit, take care and create log stash and Kibana. This is an example of Jenkins. You can see, for example, how many jobs do you have? How many jobs? Uh, what was the last build that failed? What was the last build on the stable? What is your job URL? Do you want to drill down and get more details in the Jenkins dashboard. This is an example for the Sonus Q. This is a summarized view. You have how many lines do you have, how many code, what is my vulnerability. It's everything in just one single centralized visualization that allow you to do correlations, get some metrics or insights, provide the feedback to the team. That was Pretty amazing. Once it's done, I lost my eyes doing all this, but my boss said, okay, we have a still job to do. We, how do you automate the Kibana creation? How do you automate the dashboard creation? You are still doing that manually. I don't want that. I want the whole process automated. So the solution is you have to first uh, automate the process of the index creation. The index are already in Elasticsearch, but you have to do it in Kibana. You need to create the visualization. What is the visualization? All the widgets and components that you're going to put together in the dashboard, and the dashboard is the final result of product that you you get all the metrics in one thing. What this is the process of you, you automate this part, creating all or exporting all those components of visualization and put it on GitHub and then uh, Using Jenkins, you can create the pipeline and deliver those objects to using the REST API. The final result of this infinite world was you are getting more details, you know more about your infrastructure, you know, you are, it's more easy to identify what is the source, what is the problem coming, and also you can go back one day, two days, a few weeks ago, you can go months ago and do analysis. Yes, more than 50% of all my problems were solved, but people are coming and say, do you know what is I'm getting 404, what is this 503? Yes, this is the metrics, this is the state, this is the point when your application is failing. Do you know what the container is failing? This is all the results. Thank you. That's everything. You can, I just left in the slide a couple of links so you can find out the solution. Five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Great job. Great job, Roberto. All right. So up next. 
We've got Bjorn. Come on up, Bjorn. All right, whenever you're ready, say go. Hi, everyone, I'm Bjorn. Uh, I'm a DevOps enthusiast. I'm here to talk about how to get started with your own DevOps dojo. I'm ready. Before we talk about that, I want to set some terminology straight. What is a dojo? It's, it's both a physical space and the space to learn and adopt and practice new skills and also improve on existing skills. So how does this fit into the con concept of DevOps here? Right? DevOps dojo is an immersive learning experience where a full stack product team come together into a safe and dynamic environment and uh, they learn and apply new ways of working while delivering on the real world products and services. So that's very key. Uh, this hands-on learning environment gives them the opportunity to change the culture to be more open and collaborative. Practices like agile, engineering, product design, development, etc. And most importantly, gives them a mindset of experimentation. So are you all sure you want to know more about the dojo? All right, if that's the case, I need, I need a favor. I'm going to pause a couple of times my presentation after I say DevOps, and you're going to follow up with Dojo. When I say DevOps, you say what? Dojo. All right, let's get started. Now we're going to talk about a topic. We're going to learn together about starting your own DevOps. Dojo. Starting your own DevOps Dojo. in eight simple steps. Let's go. This was a test. You all passed. Now the step number one would be to assess the current state. Take a look at your organization tool chain pipeline, there could be pockets of teams that are already doing some things that are great, right? Start from there, learn them, and adopt and improve upon that. You don't have to solve for the entire organization on day one. Step number two will be to identify and build your own toolbox. Uh, I would start do an 80-20 rule, build the most common delivery pipeline. You don't have to solve for the uh, entire tech stack. Uh, take baby steps, learn and iterate continuously. Which takes you to step number three, which is staffing your own dojo. You may have to hire and train your coaches, but look for these four important characteristics. They're curious to learn new things. They're, they're adaptable to changing environment. They're realistic on real work, and they have empathy for the teams where they're coming from. Some person has to help, a dojo master, who's responsible for an end-to-end -end execution of the dojo, and uh, they are challenging the leadership to remove bottlenecks and roadmaps. And uh, dojo coaches who are engineer coach, who lead by examples, get it's embedded with the product team, so on and so forth. Step number four, which is dojo space, which is the coolest part of the dojo. You have configurable tables, moving a rolling white screen TVs, and uh, demo lounges, etc. But don't go all in on day one. If you get all you get is a conference room, go with it. Now, with all this coming through with the toolbox and uh, designing your dojo will be the next step. Come up with a schedule for the dojo. Uh, come up with a curriculum for what the coaches are going to teach. What's the sandbox and what going to look like. Execution playbook. Uh, again, try it for the first team coming into the dojo, and I trade upon that. Step number six, the most important step. Before the team comes into the dojo, you have to prep and get them ready. Spend quality time with them and understand the product roadmap, the learning goals. Come up with their working norms, the skills matrix, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, step number seven is all nothing but just running it. Right? Make sure when the teams are learning and applying, they're doing it on the real world product. And uh, typically the iterations are four to six weeks. Within that, make sure you do mini sprints so that you're learning quickly and fastly. Make this for everyone. Uh, start, you start with a typical product team uh, and you include all the roles within the product team. Uh, you include your executives, leadership, your platform team. Just don't say this, no dojo for you. Yeah? Which leads us to the step number eight, which is forming a community of continuous learning. Treat your early adopters as champions. They will do the work for you. Build a community around it, and uh, they will help each other. Demo days, meetups, hackathons, and internal DevOps days are great ways to get started. Pro tip, there are community and experts out there. Capital One and Target are pioneers who started the dojo. They've contributed a lot of learning materials and blogs out there. So go for it, learn from them, and improve upon that. Now, just to summarize, what we talked about is Starting your dojo in eight simple steps. Assessing current, current state, building toolbox, staffing, space, designing your dojo, prepping the team coming into the dojo, running it, and building a community of continuous learning. Now we got this, what's next? Take this dojo to the next level. Dojo becomes your vehicle for change. Uh, focus on a culture, operating model, practices, and technology which leads into your DevOps transformation for your organization. Hopefully this will become your beginning of starting your own DevOps. Your own DevOps. 
Thank you. You can hit me up on uh, Twitter with more questions. I've contributed uh, to uh, some of the blogs at liatrio.com, uh, which will give you a little bit more detail on how to get started step by step. Hopefully you enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. All right, moving right along. Donna, come on up. Taming the change management beast in five minutes with Donna. You ready? I am. So hey, everybody. I'm Donna. I'm an ITSM and DevOps educator, and we're talking about taming the IT change management beast. Go. So welcome to Oldsmar. R.E. Olds, the gentleman who founded the city we're in right now, actually invented the assembly line. So back in 1901, R.E. Olds was talking about flow, and we're going to talk about flow here today. Now, we don't have to go back to 1901, but early in my career, I was a change manager. And I'm sure some of you think that means all I knew how to say was no. But I'm really passionate about IT service management, what some of you may know as ITIL, and helping organizations improve how they manage changes. When I first learned about DevOps, I was a little bit skeptical, but I was really also super excited about the idea of being able to make quality changes at speed. But I found that when I talked to DevOps practitioners about IT service management, a lot of times what I heard was some version of, we don't need no stinking processes, or y'all just need to stay the hell out of the way. And that was really discouraging to me, because I'm really, I really very much believe that IDLE and DevOps can work together. Can we agree that we need to be able to quickly make quality changes the benefit of our organizations? Yes and that they can't cause disruption. Yes, so if we can agree on the what and why of change management, then clearly it's the how that needs to change. Some of you might have super bureaucratic processes or you have lots of control gates that you need to go through. But here's the really cool thing. DevOps introduces a lot of great principles and practices that actually support the goals of change management. So I say to DevOps practitioners, if you're building quality in and if you're optimizing the risk, then prove it. Show that you're leveraging these great DevOps practices. I say to ITSM professionals, lighten up. We need to figure out the minimum viable process that we need to put in place in order to support the control objectives of our organization. Now, IDLE provides guidance on how to do this. It's something called standard changes. The idea is that if your change meets this criteria, it's pre-authorized. Go forth and make your change. Low risk, that can typically be accomplished with smaller, more frequent changes. Well understood, which means we know how to do this, we know how to optimize the risk, documented, and follows a procedure, which can really involve simply sending your change down a trusted and secure CI, CD pipeline. So in terms of documentation, change management requires two things, a request for change and a record. That request for change can live in any system that you're using to manage, your, manage and prioritize your work. So it can be an RFC, it can be an item in a backlog, it can be cards in a Kanban board. The record absolutely can be created automatically and it can be a log that shows how your change performed as it makes its way through your CI, CD pipeline. We need a record for reporting and traceability purposes. By understanding the flow of information and how work gets done, we can bring all these pieces together so that we have fast flow of information from left to right. We have fast feedback on how changes are performing and maybe any incident-related data from, life, from right to left. By integrating the change management process into people's work as usual practices, we make it easy for people to do the right thing. So some of you might be sitting there thinking, but wait a minute, what about this change advisory board that very often sits in the middle of all this stuff? That need has been dispelled. Deming said a long time ago, cease dependence on inspection. And in the 2014 State of DevOps report, they talked about the negative effects of the cap. Now, that doesn't mean that changes don't need to be authorized. but. 
We need to delegate the authority to approve changes to somebody who understands the trade-offs. We cannot sacrifice quality and reliability for speed. And if you do, you have to do it really intelligently. So if you look at the highest performing organizations, they really have a solid foundation in IT service management. In fact, a lot of the measures we use to promote the benefits of DevOps are rooted in service management. So if we can agree on the what and why of change management, then we need to quickly make changes that benefit our organizations without causing disruption. Then it's clearly the how of change management that needs to change. We need to build quality in and prove it. We need to lighten up our IT service management processes and have just enough control. And we need to focus on flow and making it easy for people to do the right thing. If we do that, if we work together, both IT service management and DevOps can achieve their promise, which is to make quality changes reliably and at speed. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Donna. All right, on to our next one. Peter, come on up. What air crew teams can teach DevOps teams? When you're ready, say go. Hit me. <laughs> so actually, oh, you replaced my first slide. OK, I wanted to say something here for, uh, first. So, uh, I'm an aviation enthusiast, and the reason why I came up with this topic is that I noticed that aviation has gotten safer and more reliable over the last 20 or 30 years, and I started to ask why and how we could apply these lessons to DevOps and DevOps teams. One of the principal ways of doing so is through a, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, please. One of the principal ways of doing so is through a technique called crew resource management. Uh, and what this is, is this is a structured way of communicating so that we use all of the skills, experience, and knowledge of every crew member. Because accidents occurred because crew was inattentive or it, uh, it, uh, uh, they didn't communicate properly. Why do we care as DevOps teams? Software is expensive, software failures have and will continue to kill people. We need people systems. So I have a couple case studies here. This is United Flight 232 in 1988, was flying between Denver and Chicago when that engine on the tail exploded, cutting off all of the hydraulic systems. Essentially, no control surfaces work, the plane was out of control. Uh, but the crew came through in a crisis. There were four crew members. They established a very minimum of control using the engines, and they divided responsibilities. They worked collaborative, collaboratively with the captain still in command. And that flight crash landed, uh, but many people survived. Uh, this is Asiana Flight 214, which in 2013, uh, crashed uh, on landing at San Francisco International Airport. Well, what happened here? Uh, the captain made several errors in configuring the flight. The crew were unwilling or unable to question those errors. So there were a couple of things going on here, over-reliance on automation, and the crew didn't think they could question the captain. So what is crew resource management? It's a way of communicating with an opening retention uh, getter, stating your concern, stating the problem if you see it, state a solution, and obtain agreement with, with the captain and all the crew members. So what are our lessons here to DevOps? First of all, stuff happens. A sense of humor is essential. Use the skills of your entire team, and automation can be a crutch as much as a help. So stuff happens. Uh, the, all three hydraulic systems failed, or in our world, the application failed in production, the cloud facility went offline. We are hit with an attack. The way we deal with these is training and practice. A sense of humor is essential in United Flight 232. Uh, you're cleared to land on any runway. The captain responded, Roger, you want to be particular and make it a runway, huh? Don't forget, humor and levity is appropriate in every situation. Use the skills of your entire team. And once again, here's the captain of Flight 232 saying, we had 103 years of flying experience, never encountered this. Remember, every team member has contributions that matter, and you need to know what that skills and knowledge is ahead of time. This is Air France Flight 447, which uh, uh, crashed in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean from Sao Paulo to Paris, France. 
What happened there was that the uh, junior crew members who were in charge, the captain had gone to a rest break, and the junior crew members who were in charge did not know how to use the automation, did not know how the automation worked. It's great for consistency, but automation failures can sneak up on you. So let's try to apply some of these lessons to teamwork. Everyone on the team has value to contribute. The leader doesn't know everything. Your automation sometimes lies like a rug and keeps situational awareness. Sometimes the value that everybody has to contribute is hard to quantify. You may find that your team has skills that are not related to their job function. Sometimes you need to work to unlock that. You need to know what your team is capable of. The leader doesn't know everything. The role of the leader is involved, evolved from order giver and final decision maker. It doesn't exist anymore. Purpose of the leader is to support the team and make decisions. Share the credit and keep the blame. Your automation can lie like a rug. It's oftentimes user error because you may not know how your automation is supposed to work, but, uh, and you never bothered to read the manual or you weren't trained, but your automation screwed you and you probably don't, won't know it until it's too late. Situational awareness, we need to know where we are at all times, what we're doing, we need to know the surrounding environment and how we interact with it. So question decisions that don't seem right and investigate problems that seem to recur. And as a final lesson, remember, you are not alone. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. All right. Now up next, Sibilance. Timothy. Sibilance. What comes next? We're laughing in five minutes. When you're ready, say go. All right, um, so my name's Tim, and today I wanted to talk about Wardley mapping. I discovered maps about a year ago, and in my work as a solutions architect, I think they've helped me make better um, technology and business decisions ever since. You might ask how? Witchcraft. They're not actually magic. Um, Wardley maps can't predict the future, but they can help us develop situational awareness, and they are good tools for understanding our environment and the forces that act on them. They were invented by Simon Wardley, inspired by the question, does this strategy make sense? At the time, he only knew how to answer that by saying, yeah, it seems similar to other strategies I've heard about. Um, but we know the world isn't that simple, right? Because context is king. King. We have a limited amount of resources to uh, place on bets for our future, and even big companies can fail if they neglect to anticipate or, more appropriately, adapt to change. Or leap maps are a way to find a better answer. They're based on this strategy cycle. I think we saw this earlier. Um, it's a mashup of Sun Tzu's five factors and John Boyd's OODA loop. And I think this bottom section where we can observe landscape and climate are what make Wardley maps unique and powerful. So maps have four important properties. They need to be visual, context specific. They show the position of elements relative to an anchor and they need to have the ability to represent movement. I could navigate from place to place on this map. Wardley maps do the same in the landscape of business. They are visual. They anchor on a customer need, and they map the value chain of components required to meet that need. They show movement via evolution on the x-axis. Position of a component on the y-axis represents its visibility to our end user. The higher it is, the more visible it is. Position of the element on the x-axis represents a stage of evolution from entirely novel on the far left to entirely common on the far right. So in this example, we are going to have a customer that is a hungry four-year-old, and we're gonna meet that need with mac and cheese. The mac and cheese needs a bowl and macaroni. Those are common, so we're gonna put them in the commodity space, and we're gonna make our own cheese sauce, so that goes custom built. Now, the cheese sauce is gonna need some milk and some eggs and some cheese, and the macaroni is gonna need hot water, which in turn needs some normal water and a stove and some power to heat it up. This is great because it shows us the estate of our mac and cheese, but it's even better when we share it with a friend because then they can question it and they can say things like, why are you making some custom cheese sauce when you can buy that off the shelf? And I know my customer well enough to know that they won't care either way. And this is where the real power of Wardley Maps come in. Because the real value of Wardley Maps is what they help us learn about our landscape and the way that they help us communicate that across our organization. They're a tool for collaboration so that we can think about our future and identify the risks and opportunities that we might see there. 
which brings us to climate. Simon Wardley defines climate as the forces that act on our environment. These basically represent the rules of the game that we're playing. And he's identified some common patterns that you're likely to encounter. Um, to illustrate some of these, we're gonna go way back to the beginning of my career and like my first job I ever had. This is, uh, I took a job as a statistician before I realized that was more about making spreadsheets than it was about doing Poisson distributions. But we had a, a certain practice that you're gonna see in a second. And our practice looked a little bit like this. Um, once a month, we'd have to produce these large benchmark packages for all the VPs, deans, and department heads. Um, every one of them would get a custom memo, a custom spreadsheet based on a custom run of reports, and all of those things we would print out, some of those green bar stuff in envelopes and send off to them. Fortunately, it was built on top of a fairly standard set of SAS reports, built on a set of data files, um, all of which were on the mainframe. And this was great, but nothing stays the same, and technology involved, and for us that meant Web 2.0 was coming, so our practice had to evolve with it. But this isn't an example of how clever we were, because we weren't clever, we were incredibly lucky. Because at the time, we didn't know how to think if this was a good move for us to make or not. Um, and since we don't want to be lucky in the future, Wardley maps are a great way for us to understand the game that we're playing, our position in that game, so we can understand the moves that might be available to us, and we can make more intentional moves in the future. And if we're doing that, whether those moves are good or bad, at least we can get better at playing the game every time we make them, and that's kind of the point. So credit, Simon Wardley invented maps. Um, I got the mapping slides from Tristan. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can read Simon's book on Medium, or learnwardleymapping.com is a great resource put together by Ben Mosier. My name's Tim, thanks very much. And if this stuff interests you, uh, come find me and we'll talk. All right, so that brings us to our final uh, Ignite of today. Will, come on up. This thing on? Okay. It's on. <clears throat> okay. Ready? Go for it. Okay, every movie has a hero, and every hero works best in a given situation. In Nielsen's journey of learning how to deploy Kubernetes, we've had many situations and many heroes. And our movie opens with a plot twist. Back in the day, Nielsen didn't know where we were going to be. Were we going to be in the cloud? Were we going to be on-prem? We weren't sure, so we decided to do both. And this situation required a certain type of hero. Who would our hero be? Rancher. Rancher is a semi-managed platform that allows for the easy deployment and abstracting away oper the operations of Kubernetes. And it really helped us because it had things like a pretty UI, there it is, pretty UI. And it also helped us onboard teams because now we don't have to inundate them with the complexities of managing a cluster because Kubernetes was new at the time. And on top of that, it also had a fully containerized deployment. When we have this containerized deployment, now we have a portable install that suddenly worked both in AWS and in our on-prem clusters. And that was great, but this abstraction level was bloated. It was slow. It didn't work quite as well as advertised. And because of that, we found that the clusters were starting to fail. We found that there were bugs that we couldn't figure out, that there was issues with networking, where we couldn't get the network to work correctly once we scaled above a certain size. We couldn't scale the cluster out when we needed to because it wouldn't get added by Rancher into a cluster. It caused it weird problems. So now we needed a new hero. Where were we gonna go? But then we had another plot twist. Suddenly we didn't have to be on-prem anymore. Nielsen decided we were going into the cloud and now we could fully utilize everything in it. We could utilize tools built specifically for the cloud. And so what hero would we choose? We chose Iron Man, we chose COPS. COPS is a platform, a application that really abstracts away a lot of deploying Kubernetes while still being able to tune everything that you need. We're fully able to make use of the cluster. We can say how HA do we want our clusters to be. We can say what do, logging frameworks do we want to use. We can say anything that we need in Kubernetes. We can specify it within COPS, and that's amazing for us. 
and we could finally make use of Google OAuth. Nielsen is a G Suite company, and suddenly we don't have to worry about user identification and verification. We can just rely on Google to do that for us, which really helped onboarding teams. So now we don't have to worry about that anymore. But we found issues. COPS has slowed down. It's lost a lot of momentum in the community. And now it's starting to fall behind Kubernetes so far that we're not even getting security updates anymore. And that's a big loss for us. And we found that COPS really is, can be complicated. When things start to go wrong, you really feel like you need a team of robots to really understand and triage the problem. And that didn't work for us. So now we needed a new hero. Who's the new hero? It's Captain America. Captain America to the rescue, managed solutions to the rescue. Suddenly we're able to make use of all these clusters, of all of the benefits of the cloud and have it managed for us. Now, we don't have to worry about making our clusters HA. We don't have to worry about the DR scenarios. We just have a push button deployment. We can automate away parts of the cluster and then everything else is done for us. We can suddenly just have something that just works. And when we have something that just works, suddenly our developers don't have to worry about it anymore. Now we can truly utilize Kubernetes instead of worrying about running it. And when you don't have to worry about running it anymore, we saw productivity gains. And we also saw a lower total cost of ownership. Suddenly we're not giving Kubernetes all of our mind share, all of our time. Now we can just build things specifically for it and to run things on it. And that really helped us. Now we're moving faster. So now at the end of our movie, we're trying to figure out what is the right level of abstraction for us? Are we trying to go with cops where we can tune everything? Are we trying to go with like managed solutions or a rancher? And we found for our specific situation that the managed solution works best for us. We're moving towards EKS. We're moving towards Google Kubernetes Engine. They both have their pluses and their minuses, but they're the hero that works for us at our time. But as we've continued forward, we find that everyone's situation is unique. And I think the real question that we should be asking is not who's our hero, but who is yours. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Will. All right, let's give it up for all of our Ignite speakers.